Shona Karusef on City Breaks. Hello and greetings from City Breaks. Welcome to episode 10 of City Breaks Munich, an episode in which I'm going to focus on that wonderful German word Kunst, which means art. I'm going to talk a little bit about periods in history when Munich was very much the city of art. And I'm going to do a review of all the main places in the city today, which you should head to if you're an art fan. There's actually so much to talk about that I've chosen to focus very much just on the German art, which you'll find in the various places. I'm going to make mention of some of the other wonderful goodies on offer, but talk only really in detail about the actual very German things to be enjoyed. So I want to start with a brief overview, historically, of century by century, what actual art was happening in the city. And we're going to come back to many of these things and talk about where you can see them. So perhaps some of the earliest things that you could see would be in the Stadtmuseum, where you can see examples of manuscripts illustrated by the monks in the very early days of the city, so pre-13th century. The monks, it was, of course, who founded the city. From about 1300 onwards, then we're talking about Gothic art, examples of which you can see out and about in the city. So if you go to the Peterskirche, for example, the altar there was sculpted by one Erasmus Grossa, and you can see a second sculpture of his called The Morris Dancers in the city museum, the Stadtmuseum. A bit later on, in the Renaissance period, come two of the really very well-known German artists, both of whom you can see examples of in the big galleries. So that would be Albrecht Dürer and Lukas Kranach the Elder. The city of Munich itself, and indeed Bavaria in general, was very influenced by the Baroque period, and we've already mentioned the work of the two main people connected with that in Munich itself, that being the Assam brothers, Cosmas, who was a fresco painter, and his brother Egid, who was an architect and a sculptor. They both had studied in Italy, in Rome, came back full of the wonders of what they'd seen, and turned their attention to such lovely buildings as the Assam Kirche, which I think I mentioned in an earlier episode. The 19th century movement Romanticism is actually very much associated with Germany. And examples of that to be seen in Munich would include a fresco by Peter Cornelius, which you can see in the Ludwigskirche. And there's a little gallery called the Schack Gallery with the work of other German Romantic painters. Alongside Romanticism was founded in 1770 what was to become one of Germany's very best-known art schools, the Akademie der Bildenden Künste, so Academy for the Visual Arts. It was set up as a school for drawing and painting and sculpture, and its aim was always to be both an academic institution and an artistic community, somewhere where artists in Munich could gather and discuss their work. The building that you see today was opened in 1886, and this is when it really took off and became one of Europe's very most renowned art schools. Associated with artists that we'll come back to, so Lehnbach taught here, and people like Vasily Kandinsky and Paul Klee were students here. It's still very much going strong. It was renovated and enlarged in 2008, and today there are about 700 students studying there at any one time. Major encouragement of art in Munich really started with Ludwig I. He was a great collector himself. You might remember he was the one who talked about wanting to make Munich an Athens on the Isar and who opened the Glyptothek, big new gallery for classical sculpture. You may recall from the episode on Ludwig II that he was very much into art, although perhaps more on a personal scale, having his amazing fantasies designed and built for him. And then a bit later on again, in the 1890s, was when Munich really did come into its own as a centre of art. At that time there was a Künstlergesellschaft, so an artist society, and about a hundred Munich artists got together and decided that that was old hat and they were going to split away and find new forms of expression. They began rejecting all the old themes, they didn't like historical paintings anymore, or religious themes, they wanted to paint daily life. They didn't want to work in studios, they favoured natural light. This may well be reminding you of the French Impressionists, who of course were working alongside over in France. And when France had Art Nouveau, Germany had Jugendstil. That translates into English as youth style. So its emphasis was on the new and the exciting and the different and the moving away from old traditions. Moving into the very early 20th century, this all came to a head in the German Expressionist movement, which had 
an offshoot of its very own actually in Munich, something called the Blauer Reiter, or Blue Rider Movement. Painters like Vasily Kandinsky and Paul Klee began to paint abstract art in very bright colours, epitomised perhaps in a painting by one of their colleagues, Franz Mark, who painted Das Blauer Pferd, the Blue Horse. Much more about them to come in a few minutes, and about the place in Munich, the Lehnbach Haus, which houses much of their work. Of course, the 1920s were marked heavily by Nazi influence, the period in which many artists were declared degenerate, and then in the 1930s, building on this, the Nazis commissioned the building of the Haus der Kunst, or House of Art, which was for approved art only, stuff that they thought was echt Deutsch, really German, and which wasn't painted by any of those pesky degenerates and subversives. So that was an era when many paintings were confiscated and burned. And then just to bring things up to date, I'm going to finish with a quick retelling of the story of Cornelius Gorlitt, an elderly Munich resident who, you may remember, was found living as a recluse in Munich, surrounded by stashes of the most amazing artwork, much of which, it turned out, his father had come across by various dubious means during the war. That was a moment, February 2012, when the Munich art world was discussed worldwide. So that gives you a historical overview. We'll be coming back to most of those things with a little more detail and some tips on what you can find where in Munich's art galleries. And the place to start has got to be the Alta Pinacothek. There are two art galleries in Munich called the Pinacothek. One's the old one, the Alta, and the other one, of course, is the Neue, the new one. And this one, the Alta Pinacothek, is the city's main gallery, which houses art from the Middle Ages up until the 18th century. Building began in 1826, which was not coincidentally one year after Ludwig I came to the throne. He was a great art collector, and by this stage there was 500 years worth of art that had been collected by the Wittelsbach family, and it needed a home, so he decided to have this gallery built. He'd inherited a lot of work from ancestors like Duke William IV, who ruled from 1508 onwards, and also the Elector Maximilian I, Ludwig's predecessor, who'd ruled from 1806 to 1825. Ludwig was delighted to have all these goodies. He had every intention of commissioning much more, buying much more, and so he had the gallery built to put it all in. And when it was built, it was the largest art gallery anywhere in the world. And usefully for our purposes, it does actually separate out quite a lot of the German art that is there. So the ground floor is given over mainly to old German masters, whereas on the first floor, there's a mix, German art and much from other countries too. And if you're really interested in the detail of what's in there, I can recommend a book to you called The Munich Pinakothek by one E. Buchner, B-U-C-H-N-E-R, which is all about the gallery and has over 40 full-page colour reproductions. My local library managed to get it for me on the interlibrary loan scheme, and I have to say it was a pound very well spent. I'm going to mention just three of the very well-known German artists whose work you can see here in the Pinakothek. And the first one is Albrecht Dürer, whose dates are 1471 to 1528. Albrecht, who was known as a polymath because he was a writer and a great thinker and theoretician as well as an artist, but it's really for his paintings and his woodcuts that he's best remembered today. Perhaps the painting to look out for that's actually here is the one called The Four Apostles, which is described in the catalogue as, quote, his final and highest achievement as a painter. It's actually two panels, each of which have paintings of two of the apostles on them, St. Paul, St. Mark, St. Peter and St. John. And they're all given individual characteristics. So St. Paul, for example, is the fighter. He's pictured with his sword in his hand, looking very menacing. St. Mark, on the other hand, is holding an open book to represent his zeal for spreading the gospel. And St. Peter is shown rather charmingly as a very venerable elderly man. The panels were painted originally for the Nuremberg Senate. They were going to put it in their voting chamber to remind all the senators of the Christian values that they were supposed to be upholding. But when it was finished, unfortunately, the Elector Maximilian saw it. He was a great collector of paintings and particularly a lover of Dürer. And he persuaded, in inverted commas, the Nuremberg Senate to hand it over as a, quote, token of their admiration. Doesn't read as if there was a great deal of choice, so this they duly did. They had a copy made to keep in the Nuremberg City Hall, 
but the real thing came to Munich and has been, as the catalogue describes, quote, considered Munich's greatest treasure ever since. Also by Dürer in the Pinakothek is a self-portrait. He was rather given to these. He'd painted several earlier ones, showing himself a bit younger, a bit more fashionable, wearing bright clothing. But at the ripe old age of 29, he decided he was worth a bit more gravitas. And so being, as one of the guidebooks I read called it, quote, not short on confidence, he painted himself as a Christ figure. This portrait is painted from the front, fully face on, which was quite unusual for secular portraits in those days. But Dürer elevated himself to being worthy of it. And he's shown with his dark curly hair flowing down and his hand raised as if he's giving a blessing and wearing some really rather sober, dark brown clothing, much in contrast to the way he'd painted himself earlier on. And then a third Dura painting, which is here, is called The Lamentation, and it's a picture of the dead Jesus just being taken down from the cross, surrounded by his mother, Mary, and St John, and Joseph of Arimathea, and other people. St John and St Joseph are both pictured holding vases, which would have been full of perfumed ointments because they were preparing to get the body ready for burial. A second artist, born about the same time as Dürer, but who in fact lived about 20 years longer, died in 1553, is Lukas Kranach the Elder. He didn't actually live in Munich. He was born near Bamberg. He worked mainly in Wittenberg, where he ran a large art workshop. And he was known particularly as being associated with the Reformation. He was actually a friend of Martin Luther, painted his portrait, which isn't here, that's in Berlin, I think, and many other religious works, but he also did paint secular subjects. And here in the Alta Pinacotique, there's a picture by him called Christ on the Cross. This was a favourite theme of his, he'd painted it a number of times. It was very much a Lutheran theme, a Reformation theme, because by painting Christ on the Cross, you're making the point that man is redeemed by Christ and not by the Catholic Church, as leaders of the Catholic Church would have had you believe. This particular painting shows Jesus on the cross and the two criminals being crucified alongside him and then down on the ground is his mother Mary being supported by St John. Obviously a sombre painting praised in the book on the Munich Pinacothek for its quote mastery of line, intense glow of colours and serious mood. Another favourite religious theme of Lukas Kranach of which there's one example here is Madonna und Kind or Madonna and Child. He painted a good number of those, about a dozen it's thought, and they're now scattered all over the world. There's one in Washington, one in Moscow, one in Baal in Switzerland, and this one which is here. Another theme, a secular one this time, that he painted many times, believed to be about 40 in fact, is that of Lucretia. Lucretia, who as legend had it, was a Roman noblewoman who was raped by the son of the Etruscan king and who went on to commit suicide, stabbed herself to death. Lucas Kranach seemed very taken with this. He painted so many versions. The early ones were generally clothed, and the later ones, like this one, were nude. In fact, it's believed that this one, which is actually life-size, was originally painted nude, and then, in about 1600, somebody using what was called, in one of the guidebooks I read, quote, a Puritan brush, added in clothing, painted a skirt over the top which was then removed again in 1919, so it was restored to the form in which Kranach had decided to paint it. And lastly, there is at least one example of the work of Hans Holbein the Elder, here in the Pinacothek, known to us, of course, mainly for his portraits, particularly the ones of Tudor kings like Henry VIII, but the work that's here isn't a portrait at all. It's something called the Kaisheim Altar. Eight panels of religious scenes, some of the Virgin Mary, some of Christ in the last week of his life, a very beautiful piece of work which is described in the Munich Pinacothek book as follows. Like a stained glass window, bright blue, subdued crimson, a warm green and purple flow through the grey and gold tracery of the structure. So those, I think, are the German highlights to be seen in the gallery, but there's lots, lots, lots more from other places, a dozen Rubens, for example some of which are on religious themes, and another one with the lovely whimsical title Helena Formant putting on a glove in her wedding dress. Helena Formant being his wife. There's Bruegel, there's a Rembrandt self-portrait and a number of other pictures, and lots and lots of Italians, Giotto, Fra Angelico, Lippi, Botticelli. They're all there. Raphael, Titian, Da Vinci, 
a feast of goodies. So if you have time, do have a look at all of those as well. But if you're a bit short of time, you could just focus on the German examples, which I've mentioned. The, if you like, twin gallery then is the Neue Pinakothek, which was founded by Ludwig I, and which specialises in 19th century art onwards. So Rococo, Jugendstil, and works by probably Germany's best-known romantic painter, Caspar David Friedrich. He was actually born in Sweden, but he later settled in Dresden, and his paintings have a very romantic German feel, landscapes, and a real emphasis on emotion and feelings. He himself said, quote, The painter should paint not only what he has in front of him, but also what he sees inside himself. So think skies, landscapes, barren trees, mists, old ruins... To mention just two of the paintings of his that you can see here, one's called The Garden Bower, which shows two figures in a garden gazing through an archway of foliage onto a Gothic church. And you, as the viewer, are standing behind them, so you feel you're in the picture too. You too are looking out through the bower. And then there's his painting called The Summer, which shows trees in the foreground and lakes and hills beyond. And if you look carefully, I actually nearly missed them. Two small figures in the bottom right-hand quarter of the painting, in an embrace. Two little people dwarfed by the massive nature stretching into the distance. Other German highlights to be found in the Neue Pinakothek are the Expressionist Gallery and a collection of so-called degenerate art, things that the Nazis had rejected. And there's a collection in the basement on applied design, which includes the Bauhaus movement. And then, just as in the Alta Pinacotheque, there are lots and lots and lots of goodies from other countries. The French are very represented here, so Manet, Cézanne, Gauguin. There's some Van Gogh, some Picasso, some Dali. I'd like to make a quick mention of a smaller gallery called the Schack Galerie, S-C-H-A-C-K, which holds a private collection of very German paintings which belonged to Adolf Friedrich von Schack and mainly focuses on 19th century romantics. So if you want to see particularly Moritz von Schwind's fairy tale paintings full of enchanted forests and turreted castles and the like, then that's the place to go for that. And a gallery you really shouldn't miss is the Lehnbach House, L-E-N-B-A-C-H-H-A-U-S, housed in an Italian-style villa which belonged to the 19th century Munich painter Franz Lehnbach, and which is now a gallery for the Blue Rider movement paintings and other associated art. Another very interesting book I read is called Munich the Golden Age by one Rainer Metzger, available in English. Very good on 19th century Munich and how it was that things came together to make Munich really a capital of art. So here, for instance, is a short description on that theme, describing Munich as, quote, a carnival capital, magnificent metropolis, Athens or Florence on the Isar, the epitome of Bavarian modernism, and comparable only to Paris in the richness of its lifestyle, Munich is a treasure house of art. The Kunstverein had been founded in 1823, but by 1900 there were 6,000 registered members including, according to one of the books I read, quote, the crowned heads of half a dozen European states. So all of that's a measure of the excitement that was felt in the art world in Munich. So this is the era of Jugendstil, of Expressionism, and particularly the Blue Rider movement. So where did that start? In 1896, one Vasily Kandinsky arrived in Munich from Russia, and he is described in Munich of the Golden Age as, quote, a one-man secession. So he arrived and really wanted to shake things up and split away from the established artists of the day and found his own movement. The same book describes his various job titles as, quote, artist, theorist, curator, teacher, designer, critic, magazine editor. In 1909, he was one of the founder members of the Neue Künstlervereinigung, so a new artistic movement, and by 1911, he was founding his own movement called the Blauer Reiter, the Blue Rider, himself a collection of like-minded artists, and it started with an exhibition. In fact, they only had two exhibitions in total. The first one showed 43 different works by people like himself, by Franz Marc and August Macker, and by the second exhibition, the same group had been joined by Paul Klee. The Blue Rider movement chose their name very carefully. One of their theories was about the use of colour. They thought colour could be used to express emotion, and for them, blue was the most spiritual colour. 
and the the writer part, the rider part of the Blue Rider movement, was also carefully chosen. It was meant to show that they were moving away from the contemporary art scene. They generally began to move away from depicting reality. They wanted more to express feelings. They often did that through the use of abstract shapes. They were certainly into very bright and unusual colours. Blue horses, yellow dogs, that sort of thing. There's a whole collection of their paintings in the Lehnbach House. Perhaps one that most epitomises what they were about is the one called Blauer's Pferd, the Blue Horse, by Franz Marc, which is recognisably a horse, but painted in blue, and against a background of hills, but which are just suggested by waves of unusual colours, yellows and pinks and greens. Likewise, there's a Paul Clay painting called Rosengarten, the Rose Garden, which has got swirls of paint to represent the roses in it, but they're lost in blocks of other colours, pink and red and purple, more reminiscent of a cityscape, really, or piles of objects, definitely more abstract than real. There are a lot of Kandinsky's paintings as well, and they get more and more abstract. So one of his earlier paintings of a concert is called Impression, Impression, and that's followed by one called Improvation, Improvisation, which shows some black stick-like figures walking along in a in a wash of waves of colour. Later on, he did some totally abstract paintings with titles like Bild mit Schwarzenbogen, so picture with a black arc. And you can see the black arc in the middle of the painting in the midst of a jumble of abstract shapes and bright colours that don't seem to me to represent anything much at all. A painting I very much did like was by August Macker and called Promenade, or Promenade, painted in 1913 and described very poignantly in a Daily Telegraph article entitled You Think You Know Munich But You Don't, which was published in 2017 and in which the journalist wrote this. Quote, a semi-simple pleasure, a man and a woman on a summer afternoon, contented in conversation, unaware of the next year's approaching storm. The next year, of course, being 1914, and it's certainly true that this very short-lived movement did fall apart at the beginning of the First World War. Both Franz Marc and August Macker were killed fighting on the front. Kandinsky fled back to his native Russia. But the paintings did survive, largely because one of their group, Capriela Münter, stayed in Munich and kept the paintings hidden, and in 1957 she donated them to the Lehnbach House to start the exhibition. You can also see traces as early as 1915 of the fact that they were becoming despised as artists, something, of course, which became a much bigger problem for artists in the next decade, in the 1920s and 30s. But I did enjoy their rather defiant quote, which came comes from the catalogue to one of their exhibitions, in which they wrote, quote, we are called degenerate and crazy, corruptors of youth, spreaders of filth, hangers-on to the art of our enemies, and, in short, traitors to the German spirit. We reject these senseless presumptions, and the criticisms bounce off us. This recognition of the contempt in which they were held does seem to be an eerie premonition of the way artists were treated in the 1930s. One of the key events in the Munich art world in that decade was the building of the Haus der Kunst, or House of Art, a building designed to showcase propaganda art and designed by the Nazi architect Paul Ludwig Trost. And there's a quote from Hitler himself about what they were trying to achieve in rejecting art which they didn't deem to be echt Deutsch, properly German. This is what he said. From now on, we shall wage a remorseless war of cleansing against the last elements of subversion in our culture. All these cliques of chatterers, dilettantes and art frauds who puff each other up and so keep each other going, will be caught and removed. You can visit the Haus der Kunst today. It's still an art gallery. It specialises in modern art and, as the Lonely Planet Guide put it, quote, exactly the artists whom the Nazis rejected and deemed degenerate, which is a nice touch. And in the foyer of the building, there's an exhibition on the history. So if you want to learn more about the treatment of artists under the Nazis, that's the place to go. For an understanding of the Munich art world in World War II, I think a, a book that really tells you, goes beneath the surface and tells you all kinds of amazing things, is a book called The Munich Art Horde by Catherine Hickley, which was published in 2015. It tells the true story of an elderly Munich recluse, one Cornelius Gorlitt, who was found in February 2012 hiding in a flat in Munich, surrounded by vast quantities of the most amazing art, much of which had been acquired by his father, who was an art dealer, 
under the Nazi regime. His father was Hildebrand Gorlit. It's a really fascinating book telling you much about what actually happened during the period and much more about the investigations into what happened to all the art that got lost during World War II, where it ended up and who profited from it. Before I tell you a brief rundown of the story, I'd like to read you the opening of the prologue of Catherine Hickley's book, which reads like this. Cornelius Corlett, a white-haired, frail old man with a ghostly pallor and watery, faraway eyes, sat in a corner of his Munich apartment. It was February 2012. Teams of officials were combing through his reclusive life, invading his private sphere and packing his most treasured possessions into cardboard boxes to take them away. They stayed four days. The Max Liebermann painting of two riders on a beach was unhooked from the wall. The Chagall vanished from the cupboard. The Matisse in the drawer disappeared into a box. Gone, too, were the reams of drawings and prints, his favourites that he kept in a small suitcase. He spent many evenings poring over those images by Pablo Picasso, Edgar Degas, Paul Cézanne, Auguste Rodin, Edward Munch, Franz Marc and Otto Dix, the yellowed paper recalling a glittering era of creativity and inspiration, of danger and decadence. The first chapter of Catherine Hickley's book starts with a New Yorker, David Torren, watching the news and seeing this flat being ransacked in Munich and suddenly realising that this had a connection to his own family history. He had escaped on the Kindertransport to Sweden and his parents had died in Germany. One of the paintings that was confiscated, the Liebermann painting called Two Riders on a Beach, he recognised it had hung on his very own wall in his home in Breslau in Germany. And there are descriptions of how many of the Breslau Jews had been forced to sell up their houses and their artworks and their jewellery at very low prices because they were desperate and flee the country. The book goes on to relate how Hildebrandt Gorlit, so Cornelius's father, had been an art dealer during this period and he'd gone round many of the galleries buying up the so-called degenerate art that the gallery owners were no longer allowed to display. I think he bought it partly for love of art and partly with an eye to making a profit. There are descriptions of Munich in 1937 and things like the exhibition of degenerate art which was held, paintings by people like Klee and Mark and Kandinsky, and quotations from the catalogue telling us what the Nazis thought of it. For example, quote, Around us you see the spawn of madness, irreverence, incompetence and degeneracy. What this show has to offer awakens shock and disgust in us all. It tells how Goebbels himself organised a purge on all the art he didn't like, which he called This Poison, and about which he said, quote, No picture shall find mercy. The book then moves to France in 1940, which of course was occupied by the Germans, and tells how many galleries there had set up showing some of the objects which had been plundered from French Jews, including families like the Rothschilds. Jewish galleries were looted, one, for example, belonging to a man called Paul Rosenberg, who had a whole collection including Delacroix, Cézanne, Monet, many others. And these things were bought up very cheaply by German dealers like Hildebrand Gorlit, and stashed away, possibly partly for his own pleasure and partly for profit. There's a description in the book of how Hildebrandt hid many of his treasures in the countryside, once the British bombing started, and how after the war he was investigated by something called the Art Looting Investigation Unit, but which he managed to dodge out of. He falsified some of his records, he said he didn't know anything about any of this, even about paintings which were later proven to have been bought by him. At one point he was actually charged with being, quote, a profiteer, but the charge didn't stick and was later withdrawn. And when he died, it was his son Cornelius Gorlit who inherited all this loot, and who lived with it in his flat for decades. In 2010, Cornelius was stopped crossing the border between Switzerland and Germany. They had noticed him toing and froing frequently, and realised that he often had €9,000 with him, which was just under the permitted limit and so they began to think he must be up to something, and investigations began. And this culminated then in the discovery of this hoard of paintings in his flat in Munich. There were headlines in the newspaper of things like Sensational Find After 70 Years. It was discovered later that he had a second house in Salzburg, where another stash was found, and in total some 12,000 works were seized, about half of which were thought to have been looted. And that left, of course, the great conundrum as to what should actually be done with all this art. 
And actually that unleashed a much wider discussion about what museums generally, who were known to have art that had been stolen, what should they do with it? Should they, 70 years later, now return it to the original families? It's all a massively complicated saga which is going to run and run, probably, and about which the historian Jonathan Petropoulos, for example, has written, quote, of a network centred in Munich of art dealers and experts who had once worked for the Nazis and who were there long after World War Two. He claims that there was a conspiracy of silence for decades, art dealers just passing works around knowing what their provenance was pro had probably been, but buying and selling them anyway. And further complicated, of course, by the fact that the descendants, where there were any, were now scattered all around the globe. So this is a story which is still ongoing. And every now and then, if you listen out in the news, you'll probably find reference to a family having their forefathers' possessions restored to them often after a long court case and a lot of investigation to prove that it actually was rightfully theirs. All of which is a murky, multi-layered story, but it is one that does highlight the importance of Munich as a centre of art, following on from the glory days of the 19th and 20th centuries. And doesn't, I hope, stop you from enjoying the idea of Munich today as a city of art, a place where there are several really top-class galleries, the Neue and Alte Pinakotheks and the Lehnbach House particularly, where you can enjoy a whole range of art, including top works by many of the world's most famous artists, but particularly seeing some very German things, right from the illustrated manuscripts of the monks, through people like Dürer and Lukas Kranach, and then the Romantics, followed by the painters of the Golden Age and the Expressionists and Jugendstil artists of the 20th century, and really come away with a sense of Munich as a centre of art and culture. And on that note, in the next episode, we're going to stay with things cultural and look at how music and literature are represented in Munich. A bit of history, a few quotes, a few stories, and some ideas on where in today's Munich you can go looking for those things. So I hope very much that you'll be able to join me next week for that. And in the meanwhile, I'd just like to sign off in German fashion by thanking you very much for listening, vielen Dank, and wishing you Auf Wiederhören. <laughs>